Layoffs at Microsoft and SoundCloud. A new startup wants to see how many Skittles you eat in the back of an Uber. And who needs an iPad when you can commute with your iMac? Jason Snell from Six Colors is here to talk tech news on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1804, recorded Thursday, July 6th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Grasshopper. Stay connected and run your business from your mobile phone with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, visit trygrasshopper.com slash twit. Hello, welcome to Tech News Today. This is a show where we talk about the biggest tech news stories of the day with people who are passionate about technology. I am Megan Maroney. Jason Howell is out on jury duty today, but joining me from his studio in beautiful sunny Marin is Jason Snell of Six Colors and the Incomparable and Macworld. Hi, Jason. Hello. I figured I would be as good a Jason Howell replacement as possible. The name's so close, so similar. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Yeah, they're, they're very close. So I thought uh, I would make you talk about some non-Apple news to start off with because you're also good at that. Uh, and then we would okay. have... <laughs> then we would have some some just Apple news to talk about, including uh, something that you wrote about podcasts that I'm very interested in digging into. So you ready? I'm ready. Awesome. The rumored layoffs at Microsoft were announced today. CNBC says the company will lay off 10% of its sales force in an effort to reorganize the way it sells its cloud platform, Azure. The jobs will look most likely be outside of the U.S., and some affected workers will be given other jobs within the company in what Frank Shaw, corporate VP of communications and jargon, says are intended to evolve the skill sets Microsoft needs. Currently, there are 71,000 Microsoft employees in the U.S. and 121,000 employees worldwide. So I think I mentioned this when we were talking about the rumors, but July is a, a scary time at Microsoft. Uh, I freelanced there for about 10 years, and July is the end of the fiscal year, so it's always a little bit nerve-wracking for everyone, but it was especially nerve-wracking. Uh, what do you think about them uh, laying off people, reorganizing, trying to sell software differently? Microsoft's a, a company in transition and has been since Satya Nadella took over that uh, the cloud focus, I think it's smart. I think he's doing a great job running that company. And I think Microsoft's doing a lot of interesting things, but it's a big ship. It takes time to to turn it, to, to change what they're selling and how they're selling it. And I think I, I find it encouraging that what this is, I mean, layoffs are terrible and it's terrible for the people who are affected by it. But at the same time, this is not Microsoft uh, getting rid of people who are making the products that they sell, right? It's they're changing the way they're selling and they're making changes to the sales force. And, and that's inevitable when you change what your product is that your company is, is selling. And Microsoft's, you know, they've come a long way, but they're not done restructuring and transitioning. And, you know, I mean, I guess no tech company has ever completely done, but Microsoft has got more, I think, more time to go before it really kind of transforms into whatever it's going to be. Uh, from what it's been as, you know, Microsoft as we know it for the last couple of decades. Yeah, I mean, cloud is so important. It's, you know, I don't know, it's a it's a huge part of the industry. When I came on the Download Your podcast, where you also talk about non-Apple news, mm -hmm. uh, we talked about Amazon and how big their cloud business was, how big AWS is, and how there's no one there to catch it, not even Google, not even Microsoft. But, I mean, maybe that's what Microsoft is hoping by doing this. They say it's not a cost-cutting measure. It's just really more focusing on putting their software in the cloud instead of in that box that we were used to forever. Yeah, and this is, it's no mistake that all of these huge tech companies are focused on providing more cloud services. This is where the world is going and you want to have a foothold and you want to be a major player in that. Even if you came from like Amazon, Microsoft and Google all came from very different places for their sort of original business, but they're all fighting in the cloud now because it's a very important place to be. Well, in other layoff news, SoundCloud is letting go of 40% of its staff, according to a blog post by the company's founder, Alex Jung. The decades-old music, decade-old music and podcast streaming service will close offices in San Francisco and London. But Jung says that SoundCloud will still be available in 191 countries globally, 
rumored purchases of the company first by Twitter and then Spotify apparently fell through earlier this year, forcing SoundCloud to borrow $70 million to remain in business independently. Do you put a lot of your podcasts on SoundCloud? No, I don't do any. I mean, I, I feel bad uh, kicking them when they're down a little bit, but SoundCloud's always been this uh, a problematic uh, <laughs> website because they they do podcasts. They've explored doing podcasts, but the podcast stuff they do is kind of non-standard. They, wanna, they don't really want you to be in a podcast app. They want you to be in a SoundCloud app or on SoundCloud's website. They found a lot of traction with musicians, which I think is great, but, you know, they're searching for a business model. It's hard to find as a, you know, creative website. It's hard to find a business model. I have to admit, I was taken aback by the number. I think they said it's something like 170 employees who are losing their jobs. It's like, I had no idea SoundCloud was that large. And maybe that's the story here is that they uh, kept growing their staff in and placing a lot of bets about where they thought the business was going. And then they realized, as that blog post says, that they were um, they were spending spending too much money and they needed to retrench in order to keep the company going and go in some new directions. And that's sad because there's a lot of cool stuff about SoundCloud. Although, yeah, I wasn't a fan of their podcast uh, initiative. I think they're better as a kind of a music sharing service for bands and, and uh, other musical artists especially. Yeah, I mean, it sounded like they had, they always had a lot of cachet. You know, it was like cool to be on SoundCloud for musicians, but that didn't really, um, you know, ever become something viable and it's unclear to me whether they want to stay independent and that's why they're struggling or if they just uh, couldn't you know make a deal that they, they really just weren't something that Spotify or Twitter wanted to buy I mean it sounds like it's we don't really know they they said they borrowed 70 million dollars or they were going to get 70 million dollars we don't know if they actually got that it might be contingent on these layoffs but it sounds like they'll still be around in some form or fashion it's a tough situation when you end up uh, as a tech company uh, not quite making it and not having an exit where you keep expecting somebody to buy you and they don't. And that that's the that's kind of in-between place seems to be where SoundCloud is now. And I hope they I hope they figure it out. I hope they stick around because there's a lot of good stuff inside of SoundCloud too. And, uh, you know, it, but it's tough. You know, they, you play some bets and sometimes the bets don't come through. And that seems to have happened with at least some of the bets that SoundCloud placed. I didn't mean to make so much bad news all up at the top, but Tesla <laughs> stock has fallen almost 17%. I guess it's not bad news if you hate Teslas, um, but it's bad news for anyone who loves the company. Um, they the, they had news that their the cheaper Model 3 is three weeks ahead of schedule, but that didn't keep uh, them from their stock from dropping. The Wall Street Journal notes that delivery of Model S cars and Model X sport utility vehicles were lower than analysts expected due to the battery supply issue. And that caused a lot of analysts to give the company a sell rating. At the close of trading today, Tesla's market cap was down to $50.7 billion, which knocks them out of the top spot on the list of most valuable U.S. automakers. General Motors now regains that spot, which they had before. Their market cap is at $52.6 billion. So are you, are you in the market for a Model 3? Did you Are you on that list? I'm not on that list, although I did buy an electric car about a used Nissan Leaf because I feel like it's early days yet and it's a fun car and we got it for a pretty good price. But I'm intrigued by the Tesla Model 3. Um, it would be the most expensive car I've ever bought if I bought it and this the cheap Tesla. But I don't know. This seems like a stock story um, more than a Tesla story. I think Tesla... Um, did some investors not understand that Tesla and Elon Musk tend to overpromise and under deliver? That's just they're late. They're always late, but they do seem to get there in the end. Um, it is true they're gonna they're gonna ship the Model Three early. I, I did look. I think they're gonna ship a hundred of them in August. I mean, it's like almost nothing, but they hope to be up to more than ten thousand a month by the end of the year. It's gonna take some time, and maybe there was some. Um, some enthusiasm that wasn't placed properly in the investment community about that. But, you know, I, I think there's good news for Tesla in here in general. The fact that they are getting this Model 3 off the assembly line, they're starting to ramp up. They're, they, they have had some battery issues. It'll be interesting to see how much Tesla needs to ramp up its own battery production and whether it will consider working with other companies. I know China, Chinese companies are really ramping up battery production in China. Um, Tesla's talked about doing a battery factory in China as well. So it's so, it's so early. But um, and and there are lots of other t car companies that are that are coming on. Volvo said this week that they're going to just uh, do electric and hybrid cars starting in I think like 2022. Like it's fairly soon. So um, Tesla's got a, a 
a leg up, but it's still a long game and it's just the very beginning of it. So I don't know. At least they're shipping the Model 3. I mean, I think people were really skeptical of it if it would ship a, a year after they said it would. And so shipping it on time, even if it's in tiny numbers, you would think would be a positive signal that they are they actually have a product and they're going to ship it and they're going to start to make good on all those orders they took. Yeah, I mean, you're sort of an expert in this way, like that analysts uh, judge a company and make their stock go up and down and then tech writers write about it. Like, that's just always the case with Apple. Like, we have these super high expectations and then, you know, the analysts say, oh, no, no. And then everyone thinks there's going you know, to be the last <laughs> iPhone or something like that. In the t well, in the tech, uh, the funny thing about the tech business in general is that there are two different types, types of audiences in the tech world. There are the people who are enthusiastic about the products and there are the people who are investors. And what those two groups look for is very different. Like, if you you're, if you're thinking about Tesla as an investment or Apple as an investment or any other company, what you're looking at is very different. So oftentimes Apple will come out with huge quarterly results or they'll release a new iPhone and it'll do incredibly well and the stock will go down. And people who are product focused don't understand this because it's like what they have new products and people are buying them. Why is the stock going down? And the answer is because the stock already got up. In, uh, into those heights because they were anticipating all of that stuff happening. They're ahead of the game. And now they're, uh, now they're anticipating what's going to come next and that maybe there'll be a little bit of a downturn. So this is a perfect example with Tesla where I looked at this and said, it's great news that Tesla's actually shipping a Model 3. But for the investors, it's like, mm, maybe it's not what they expected. And, and it's all about expectations. If what happened today makes the future seem a little bit worse for Tesla than what everybody expected yesterday, stock will go down and that's what's happened and like you said like volvo is i think it's 20 i feel like they said 2019 is when they're going to have maybe maybe um, that soon yeah yeah and a lot of these companies the leaf is a great car and scooter x in our chat room just posted a link that they the next leaf not not the one that you have the next one will have autonomous parking so everybody seems to be catching up to those things that tesla you know only you can only do with a tesla so they i i don't know i mean it's true that this cheap tesla doesn't seem cheap to me either but we'll see and speaking of auto news no place is safe from convenience commerce even the back seat of your uber or lyft mashable reports that a new startup called cargo will let uber drivers sell you necessities like energy bars lightning cables aspirin and even condoms right from inside the car you can also use the service to tip your driver it's free for the driver and some of the items are even free for you and then the driver gets paid whether you take these free items when you take these free items, the driver gets paid, even though you haven't paid for them, which doesn't necessarily sound like the business plan for a successful startup, but I have seen worse. Cargo makes deals with companies, so don't expect this to be there to be a wide variety of different mints. Cargo has made exclusive deals with Altoids, so we only get Altoids. This was so interesting to me because... I guess it doesn't sound like at first I thought, oh, like this must be some sort of like Mary Kay pyramid scheme where like you have to, the driver has to buy all the products and then you get stuck with them. But they say that they're free for the driver and the technology is free for the driver. And then I looked at their privacy policy and then I realized what they were probably doing is that they can see like whether you took the free energy bar and how much you paid for the condom and, you know, all of those things that you're buying or not buying when you bought it and using that data to, to sell to whoever, you know, the highest bidder, I'm guessing. Of course it's about data because otherwise I guess it doesn't really make sense. I, I looked at this story and I thought, are we in a comedy sketch now? Have we gotten <laughs> to that point where this is, I guess it's like a mini bar for Uber that you can, I don't know, it seems very strange to me. I get the idea that it's like marketing freebie kind of thing that uh, you want people to try out these products or you're doing market research about what do they take and what do they not take. But um, I think you you made the point. It doesn't sound like the greatest business plan in the world. This seems like one of those things that somebody thinks they've got a good idea and they got some investment money and that money will be spent and then they'll go away again. But uh, it does. I did check to see if this was a joke or not. I will admit because it sounds it sounds like a comedy a comedy bit about how far we've become detached, how far the technology industry has become detached from reality. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it does kind of seem like a hoax. But yeah, I mean, I don't know when you go when when I go on a trip, whether it's like a road trip or you know, I don't go off into the desert or any place that I'm very far from a Seven Eleven or some equivalent. But I still feel like, oh, I have, to, I have to have 19, like, lightning cables, and I have to make sure that I have extra food. And, you know, I still have that sort of depression era. Like, I, you know, I got to have everything. Even though any, you can buy anything 
anywhere, wherever you are now. Yeah, it's true. I do. I get. I get the convenience of if you're in an Uber and you're like, oh, I forgot my lightning cable or I'm really hungry and do you have a snack or something that I can get? I kind of get it, although it seems really weird that like you could also tell the Uber driver to pull over and go buy something. I guess it's more convenient if they don't have to stop driving. But I, I don't know. Most of the Uber rides I've taken have been fairly short. And the last thing I want to do is is do some you know product transactions while I'm in the car with the Uber driver. But you know, maybe other people use Uber in a different way. And that for them, this is the perfect, you need that product right on the spur of the moment, whether it's a lightning cable or a condom and the, your Uber driver is your buddy and, and they're, they're there for you. I just, yeah. Okay. I guess, I guess that could be a thing. Maybe, I mean, they can't, there's no room for a vending machine in your Uber. So instead there is this uh, cargo. Well, I mean, you can also imagine that it, you know, for the future when there's not even a driver selling it to you, you know, it is like a, it is like a mini bar, like your Uber will be yeah. like a hotel room. Or a vending machine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I could, I could see it. Yeah. I mean, I suppose so. Why not? I'm a little surprised. This is interesting too, that it's, it's cargo. So it's not, I, if this was really seen as a, an opportunity, wouldn't Uber or Lyft want this for themselves, Right. I, that also seems a little bit strange to me, but maybe there's something about treating their drivers as contractors that this is one of those holes where another company can kind of get in and get access to the Uber or Lyft customers. Yeah. I mean, I, I it does make me wonder if like a month from now we're going to say, you know, your Uber saying like you can't do this because it violates our terms <laughs> yeah. of service in some way because we want to do it essentially. But the other thing that worries me is that you get paid, they say you get paid like a, a dollar up to a dollar fifty per customer, but then there's also bonuses and referral bonuses, which makes me think like the next time you get in to one of these cars, you're going to be constantly, you know, like, would you like to buy this? Would you like to buy this? Would you, you right. know? Right, it's an upsell. The, yeah, although, you know, you could also argue that that, uh, although Uber and Lyft might not stand for it for very long, that's what you, you get what you pay for. The fact that the drivers aren't compensated as well as maybe they should be. So they feel like they need to bring in extra money by having a, having some product offerings. And maybe there's a trade-off there that there'll be a new class of Uber where you pay a little bit more and there's nobody selling you stuff. There's no, it's the ad-free version of Uber. Right. But I guess, yeah, whenever I see that, you don't, you don't have to download an app, but you do have to go to a website and you have to sign up. And so that means like suddenly, you know, it's this cashless society where every single thing you buy is tracked somewhere for someone. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> if you've ever wanted a third thumb, I mean a second thumb, I guess, or a third thumb, you have two thumbs. So a third thumb or two thumbs on one hand, this is the story for you. I, I'm not sure I've ever wanted any of this, but The Verge says an artist named Danny Claude designed a wearable with an extra thumb that you can attach. So you have one on each side of your hand. This way you can carry more objects play more complicated chords on the guitar, maybe even type on one of the new iPad Pros with one hand. I tried to I tried to hold mine and see if I could reach around. I, I don't have the um, extra thumb, but I don't know if it would work that way. So you control the prosthetic with a Bluetooth pressure sensor that attaches to your shoe and then adjusts the extra thumb with the movement of your foot. Um, so yeah, would you want, you want an extra thumb? Jason. No, no, absolutely not. This is, this is, so I, I decided that this is, this is the game today, right? Is pick which story is totally a fake. I picked this one. This is totally a fake, right? This couldn't be real, right? You know, I, you almost had me with buying condoms in the back of an Uber, but then the third thumb or the second thumb, the, the sixth finger, whatever it is, it's too, it's too many. It's, it's no, it's, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's a tool for like a musician might want it. Like, oh boy, I wish I had extra fingers. But the fact that it's like what Bluetooth and it's attached to a device on your, on your ankle or on your, on your foot is like, come on. Like, come oh my, what do we not have better things to do with our time than it was this a video design project. Yeah. So it's, it's very not a, clever. Yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah. I think that the verge got it from like D zine, which is like the design magazine, but I guess, um, yeah, it's not a thing that you're buying in the back of your Uber anytime soon, but it is. Uh, Thank goodness. <laughs> but you could, I, I like the way that you use your foot, which I thought was like, why your foot? But the way they described it is like, that's how you drive and that's how you operate a sewing machine. And you do have certain motions <laughs> that you use your foot for. So why not an extra finger? The, uh, the picture of holding a, a cards, playing cards where you've got the extra thumb. Like, you know, I, I think it's a great art project too, I would say, as a, as a bit of a kind of a humorous 
uh, uh, commentary. Although I will say that, you know, prosthetics are a real uh, thing with a serious need. And yes. this is funny uh, and cute. And I, I, my, but my first thought in looking at it is either this is applying things that we've learned from building prosthetics, which is kind of cool, or it's some um, stuff that maybe will give people who work with prosthetics some ideas about it. And that would be cool too. But you know, it's a little, it's a little bit silly, more than a little bit silly. I, I'm not going to wait in line for my uh, extra thumb, alas. Okay, but have you ever been at a cocktail party and you have a glass of wine and then you have a plate and you need to put things on your plate? Sure, sure. You got to have an extra hand. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to hold out for the extra arm, the extra bone, the bone of a third arm, okay. like a mountable <laughs> or, or like a tray that I can just strap on and use as a... As, a, as my own little shelf, something like that, I would probably be more into. But a thumb, I, you, we can't stop at a thumb. The thumb is not enough, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, thank you for playing along, Jason. <laughs> Did I win? What do I win? <laughs> you, 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 you win an extra thumb. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Uh, a quick reminder, if you want to discuss that extra thumb or buying condoms in the back of an Uber or anything else that we discuss, you can comment on anything. You can email us at tnt at twit.tv. And of course, you can subscribe to Tech News Today by going to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. And after the break, of course, Jason can talk about all the tech news. But as long as we have him here, we're going to grill him about some Apple news. But first... This episode was brought to you by Grasshopper, a virtual phone system designed for entrepreneurs. Grasshopper works just like your old fashioned traditional phone system, but so much better. You don't have to buy any hardware. They have an iOS and an Android app, and then callers can reach you wherever you are on your mobile phone. Grasshopper allows you to keep your existing number so you can maintain your brand. When you make a call, the person you're calling, your client, or whoever it is, will see your Grasshopper caller ID instead of your personal phone number. All you have to do is select a toll-free number or a local number, record your custom greeting, say whatever you would say to sound as professional as possible, and then add all the multiple extensions for your business. If you have a toll-free number, they look great. It just looks good when you're, if you're ever calling a business, you know, you're not just calling someone's cell phone number. They're going to pick up when they're out of the bar or whatever. Get a toll-free number that looks, makes you look professional and that makes your business sound more professional. Set up department and employee extensions with custom call forwarding to any phone in the world. So this isn't just for you running your own business by yourself. If you have employees, this is great for them too. They can all have their extensions and they can get business calls on their cell phone. You can get voicemails emailed to you as audio attachments. You can send and receive SMS text messages from your business number. Lots of businesses are operating with text messages today. It makes it so much easier. Join the over 250,000 Grasshopper customers today. Plans start at just $12 a month. And there's no reason not to try because you have a 30-day money-back guarantee. I hope it will work for you. I think it will. Turn your smartphone into a business line with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, go to trygrasshopper.com slash twit. That's trygrasshopper.com slash twit. And we thank Grasshopper for their support. So we are already over the 2017 iPhone. We haven't even seen the real one. We don't even know what it's going to be called yet, but we're on to 2018. Nikkei reports that Apple will release three new iPhone models in 2018, all with OLD, OLED screens. Jason, do you say OLED or OLED? I think I say OLED these days, but you know, I could be convinced that I say I say GIF to, instead of GIF too. So don't ask okay. me. Okay. I don't know. What do, what do I know? <laughs> Let's say OLED because it's easier. Uh, sure. What are we to make of this news? I think it's confusing. Like some of the headlines I saw seem to be confusing this with the iPhone that's coming out this year, but then a lot of the news says the next iPhone won't really actually get into people's hands until 2018. Can you explain this to us? Uh, well, the, the big rumor is that there's going to be an iPhone um, 7S and 7S Plus this fall, and also an iPhone 8 or iPhone Pro. We're not really sure what that one's going to be called. And that's going to be like the cutting edge, high-end new design phone, very small bezel, um, more expensive. That's going to be the one that's the first OLED screen iPhone. There was a rumor this week that they were uh, that Apple's got um, face recognition technology that they're using and that there may even not be a Touch ID sensor, which I am really skeptical about that. 
uh, both of those things, in fact, that Apple has built some sort of face scanning technology that works just as well and is just as reliable as Touch ID and that they wouldn't have Touch ID on a phone. I'm a little skeptical of that, but that's the rumor. So it sounds like this story may be suggesting that that next year the iPhone will be going all OLED, which wouldn't be a surprise because once Apple builds in new display technologies and other new technologies, they tend to start to push it across their product line rather than having inconsistent inconsistency. So they may like have this first phone that is OLED. It's not their first OLED screen. The um, Apple Watch is an OLED screen, but their first OLED iPhone and they and maybe they go from there. So you don't think that we would have like OLED screens and, you know, traditional screens for many years competing against uh, each other? I mean, it, eventually, I, Apple does like selling old models, but I think the new models, you know, from from there on out would be OLED once they do this this OLED phone. If they do that this year, along with the more traditional um, phone, the, the 7S, let's assume that that would probably be the last new iPhone, like with new design and new technology to have the old screen technology. If they can move everything in the iPhone line to OLED, I'm sure they will do that eventually once they get started. I don't think they're they're going to have sort of like mixing and matching. The new, the new stuff will use the new screen tech. So this kind of rumored 10th anniversary, you know, secret, super secret, all glass iPhone, eight that people are going, you don't think that that's going to happen at all? Oh, I think it might. I, I mean, the rumors have been pretty strong. The, they suggest that it may ship later, which means that they, even if they announce it in September and may not be ready at the same time in mid-September that the iPhone has traditionally been available, it may be more like in November or December or even after the first of the year, even if maybe they say it ships by the end of the year and a few trickle out. It sounds like it's more expensive to to make. It's going to be more expensive to buy. It's going to be much, you know, new, new materials and new technologies and things like that. Um, it's going to be a, an object of desire, but it may not be an object that everybody wants to buy because the price is going to be a lot higher. But it'll be the cutting edge iPhone design. And I think that's reasonable that, that Apple would do that. I, I guess Apple could get away with an iPhone 7S and 7S Plus in another year of that design. That would be four years of phones with more or less the same design. But the rumors are so strong on this one that it seems impossible at this point that there isn't another phone that is being built that will be like this new generation released in parallel with the old generation because it's just too expensive to hold down the line all by itself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that makes sense. Do you want an OLED screen? Like, is that something you desire? I don't think the OLED screen is going to be the reason for it. Um, there are advantages in having an OLED screen. You know, the fact that you can do things like dis it, it, it's so low power that you can do things like display in certain areas, like display the time. There are Android phones that do that where they're always on for a certain amount of uh, like just time display and things like that. You don't have to wake them up to see. I think that would be... Uh, an advantage. I think the colors are vibrant. I think that could be good. If Apple builds a really beautiful OLED display, I have no doubt that it will look great, but that can't be it, right? I mean, people aren't going to spend several hundred dollars more for a slightly bigger or higher density iPhone with uh, smaller bezels and an OLED screen. I think that there has to be other tech in there, which is why the idea that there's a bunch of like range finding stuff both on both sides of the device so that you can do better augmented reality than the current phones can do so that you can do things like face unlock if they can really make that work. Um, it, it, you know, Apple's pretty good at collecting a few features together and spinning them into a story about why you need to upgrade. That's sort of how they've gotten where they are. So there will have to be a story around that special phone if it does end up existing. And the OLED screen is one of the pieces, but it's not the whole story. It can't be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, back to that facial recognition story that came out earlier this week or last week. I think it was Mark Gurman and, you know, his sources are often right. But I mean, what he said was his sources say that Apple's testing facial recognition. So like they're always testing everything, right? I mean, it just seems so unlikely. They're so big in security and it just feels like no, I mean, everyone has found a way to get around face unlock. And I don't, I, I don't know how they would, would replace your fingerprint with that. Yeah, everybody's tried it. Nobody's done a good job. Doesn't mean Apple couldn't do a good job. But uh, to, you know, when you're somebody I saw on Twitter said, I'm 
going to the tube like in London and I need to very quickly uh, do touch ID so I can tap and get into the turnstile. And it's like, well, what are you going to do with your phone? You're going to do a, will there be a way to lock it and keep it unlocked that isn't awkward and you know it's looking at your face or does it sense your presence somehow or are they going to offload some of this to apple watch and then people who don't have apple watches won't get those features it's hard to believe apple's invested so much in touch id it's hard to believe that even if they offer uh, you know other authentication methods that they wouldn't also have a fingerprint sensor somewhere even if it's on the back because the idea here is that the screen being edge to edge they don't really have the ability to get a reliable touch id sensor on the front but i've got a nexus 5x it's got a touch id sensor on the back essentially a fingerprint scanner on the back works great so maybe there's more to this story generally with these apple rumors there's more to the story it's like that parable of uh, the blind men trying to describe the elephant and they they all are describing the own the, the own little part of it and none of them thinks that it's an elephant they only know what they they're touching. It's a little like that. Like people know features of what a new iPhone has, but they don't have the whole picture until Apple kind of comes out with it. And I, I suspect that's what's going on here is we don't know all the pieces of the puzzle. If the iPhone 8 was shaped like an elephant, I would absolutely buy it. Just Interesting say. idea. Well, we'll see what the uh, supply chain tells us in the next <laughs> okay. few months about that elephant phone. So you have a great piece uh, in Macworld about how iOS 11 will change the way we listen to podcasts. We heard a little bit of that at WWDC. There was going to be, you know, better discovery, you know, better uh, ways for podcasters and advertising companies to be able to see like when, you know, you stop la listening to us because we've gone on and on too long. Um, what, but I, I, are these features already in iOS 11? I tried to look around. I mean, obviously that tracking is something outside of the podcast app, but but are they are? Can you play around with these if you've installed the beta of iOS 11? No, there are some things that are in there, but it's more like at the developer conference Apple had in June, they said, this is where we're going in iOS 11 in the fall. And they told podcasters, here's what you need to do to update your feeds to get these new features. The podcast app in the current public beta of iOS 11, it's got some of that metadata, but not really in any usable form. So there, it's still a work in progress. I think that they're still tinkering with it. I, I did, I got some feedback from people who said, but I just went into the beta and it's not there. And, and it's like, yeah, it's not there, but their intent is for it to be there in the fall. And the idea is there are so many podcasts like Serial where you need to listen from the beginning instead of from the end. And then there are other podcasts that are very timely, like this one, where you want probably the latest episode is the one you want to listen to. And the default for all podcasts has been the latest episode. And they added a bunch of tags to be put in the podcast feeds that supply podcasts, the, the, the back, the secret stuff that nobody actually sees that gives the podcast app information about what is in a podcast. Now podcast creators can say, oh, this is meant to be listened to from the first episode forward. They can say, this show has seasons so that you can listen to season three or season two. And also things like teasers and bonus material, which previously were either just sort of littered into the regular podcast feed or they weren't, they were in a separate feed that nobody could listen to. You can put those in the feed and mark them as bonus material or as a trailer for your new season. And the podcast app will do the right thing when it ships ideally in iOS 11 this fall. But in the betas, it's not really there yet. It's still, it's a, it's a great example of Apple kind of using its influence in podcasting to try and um, better support some of the new kinds of podcasts that have been out recently and are very popular, Serial being the best example. Right. I mean, because I, I went in and uh, did you listen to Homecoming, the, that uh, podcast, the story podcast? No, I haven't. Oh, it's from Gimlet Media. It's great. It stars Catherine Keener. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just it's a basically a drama. Um, I think they've actually optioned it for TV, um, but it is excellent. And I went and looked and, yeah, it still goes the opposite way instead of. Um, you know, the right way. But I, I yeah. highly recommend Homecoming. I, um, I'm surprised okay. that I've, that I've um, listened to something that, that, that I know something you don't know, Jason. I it's don't, <laughs> you know, I don't have a commute anymore. So my podcast listening is tough. I, I have to find time when I'm walking the dog or washing the dishes to listen to podcasts. But, you know, I, I love a podcast called Hello from the Magic Tavern. It's kind of an improvisational comedy podcast and it's got an ongoing storyline. And that's a great example where you kind of need to listen from episode one, mm -hmm. not from episode 100, because you won't understand what you're listening to. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of shows like that. So now, or 
this fall anyway, you when you will get that, uh, find that podcast and say, I want to listen, it'll give you episode one and not episode 100. And that's that's the right thing to do. And and I would imagine this is not just going to be Apple's podcast app. So one of the points I make in that article is uh, the the podcast feed specification is open. Like this is not trade secret stuff by Apple. Every podcast feed is readable by any podcast app in existence. Apple is so prominent. It's more than half of the podcast listening that happens happens in Apple software. It's just a fact. That means that Apple can put one of these new tags in and say, hey, everybody do this. And not only will everybody do that, but every Everybody who writes another podcast app, if you're using Pocket Cast or Overcast or anything like that, you will get um, the ability to probably use these same features in those apps because it's open. Those developers know what Apple's doing and they're probably all putting it on their list to support seasons and teasers and bonus material and all of those things too. So in the end, I think it's going to be great for everybody who listens to podcasts. I'm really excited about knowing the, you know, digging down and knowing all the details about what listeners or viewers want from us also, because, you know, I mean, you hear from people all the time, especially, you know, when we first started Tech News Today to, well, restarted it two years ago, um, you know, there was a whole bunch of people who were like, ah, oh, it's too long, you know, and then a lot of people were like, it's too short. And, yeah. you know, it really depends on, you know, what kind of commute you have usually or how many dirty dishes you have, um, whether something is too long or too short. And, you know, I mean, you can you can sort of base that on the people that take the time to email you or tweet at you. But there's a whole lot of other people who, you know, don't won't ever do that. I'm one of them, you know, um, that wouldn't like, you know, I don't usually email podcast um, hosts. So I'll just stop listening if I don't like it. And so I would love to know, you know, if we are too long, too short, you know, what people like, where they turn off, that sort of thing. Yeah, and Apple will be able to, for the first time, let podcasters do that. And I think that'll be good for podcasts, podcast listeners too, because we're all going to have a better idea of when, when you know, when too much is too much. And and if I think it's going to happen that a lot of podcasters are going to realize that they can release a two-hour podcast if they want, but that you know more than half of their listeners don't get through the first. 80 minutes of it or 50 minutes of it or whatever that number is. And they're going to realize, oh, why am I even wasting my time with a two hour podcast if nobody can make it to the end? And and that maybe that will be um, that'll be informative. That'll that'll make the podcast maybe tighter and uh, better. And uh, we'll learn, you know, uh, we'll also learn like where the ads go and when uh, when people are listening to ads and when they aren't. And it's good because people don't know. Podcasters have no idea how people listen to podcasts now. All we know is you downloaded the file and that's kind of it. So by providing this data to podcasters, that'll be a big step forward. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll know if people like listening to a podcast about two podcasters talking about podcasting. Yeah. Because or if that. we've just, everybody has left the room now. Yeah. It's entirely possible. Anyone? We'll know someday. <laughs> Well, according to The Telegraph, Austinite David Hill on Twitter posted an image today of a woman who has a unique, unique commuter setup. Apparently, she travels by train with an iMac. This wasn't in Austin. It was in London on the Virgin East Coast, Darlington. Uh, that's an actual iMac that she yep. has set up. Have you ever seen that? I have absolutely seen this. I don't know why this is even news. I ha Have you not ever seen somebody with an no. iMac in a Starbucks? Oh, yeah. I've never I see seen the, I, it at a Starbucks. I've seen this several times in San Francisco at a Starbucks. I've had friends who've seen them in New York City where people bring an iMac into a Starbucks and they basically set up shop and they work for the day on the iMac. And the answer is they don't have a place to work and they don't have a laptop, but they have an iMac. And so they trundle it out and they bring it in and plug it in. And it's a thing. I don't understand it either, but I think that's the answer is she probably has heard of a laptop, but she doesn't have a laptop. She just has the iMac. So she's... And she needs to get some work done and there's a power outlet. So that's what she's going to do. And maybe she's tr where she's traveling to, she needs her computer there too. And she just doesn't have a laptop. And, uh, you know, I'm sure if she had a laptop, that's what she'd do. But sometimes people don't have the laptop and they've got this this desktop computer. So they, they yeah, I've seen this at Starbucks and it's weird, but it's a thing. It, this is not new. This is a This is a thing people do. It is when you see it, you kind of can't look away. Have you ever seen someone with like one of the big stand up like old PCs, you know, the big towers? Uh, I think if you have to hook up a lot of cables, it's harder. But yeah. uh, I would love that. That would be great if somebody get, rolled into Starbucks in the morning and like pulled out a mini tower and then pulled out a monitor and ran the cables. And yeah, that would be hilarious. I feel like just doing that just as like a sort of, I don't know, art project with my extra thumbs. Extra thumb. That's <laughs> it. That's how you do it.
Well, okay. So when you've seen these people at Starbucks, how do they carry them? Do they have like a giant bag, a suitcase? Like, yeah, I, uh, well, the guy was there when I walked into the Starbucks and I saw him, but <laughs> I, I imagine that, th that he's got like a little trolley or something like that. I think, ah, oh, see, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Desktop PC at Starbucks. It happens. It's, I don't understand it, but, uh, it happens. It's, okay. it's, it, you do wonder if it's performance art, but I don't think so. I think it's, uh, people who don't have other computing options. You know, we, we who are in deep down in the tech world here talk about, well, I've got my iPhone and my iPad and my laptop and my desktop and all that. But sometimes people only have one computer. And yeah. so you got to do what you got to do. That's basically what I saw. The, uh, <laughs> big iMac on a table at Starbucks. It's kind of unruly, but I guess it works. I guess, I guess so. We got some feedback back. How Quinn sent us a message on Twitter about a discussion that we had last week on whether Facebook was listening to us or not. A viewer wrote in to me, convinced that Facebook was listening to her conversations after she started seeing advertisements for a children's book she had previously discussed with a friend. She'd never searched for that book, nor did she even have any children. How Quinn writes, I'm a digital marketer and maybe I can help explain the possibility. If this person's friend liked that children's book, that children's book page, then the marketer of the book chose to target friends of people who likes this page. There's a high likelihood of being targeted. Facebook ads are so smart, especially comparing compared to Twitter ads. She, how Quinn also included a screenshot of what the marketer might have chosen. So good to know. Have you ever had anyone be suspicious that Facebook was listening to them based on their ads that they saw? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, a lot of a lack of understanding about how this stuff works where they feel they're being stalked and it feels creepy because of your behavior on the internet. I, I feel like even though it's not necessarily as creepy as it feels, it mm -hmm. feels creepy, mm -hmm. still feels creepy. Yeah, I mean, my argument last week when we were discussing this is it's actually a lot creepier than the fact that, you know, they're, they're not listening to you. That would be the easy thing. It's just like if you really could see all the data that you're willingly giving over by, you know, buying Skittles, in the back of a lift, et cetera, you know, then that's more creepy than the, if they actually had a microphone listening to everything you were saying. Yeah, there's a lot of that. You know, people don't understand how a lot of this tech works and there's a lot of bad behavior out there too. But, you know, I, I think there are a lot of misunderstandings about like, is Gmail, is somebody at Google reading your mail? Well, no, even though alg algorithmically they're looking at the content to generate ads, although not anymore or not for, not for much longer. Facebook is not stalking you around the web really, but there are there's data being generated that will show you ads that's based on be your behavior. And the same, the little personal assistants in your house, they're not streaming all the audio and video that is everything in your kitchen to their servers where they process it. They're waiting for a wake word and then they're waking up and sending your commands and processing those. So it's one of those things that, yeah, it could be bad, but in general, it's not. Well, finally, bears are super cute, I think, but not mm -hmm. if they're close enough to eat you. The Next Web notified us today that an update to Google Earth will allow you to hang out with Alaskan brown bears for free. No pricey cruise required. The Voyager section of Google Earth now supports live video feeds. And that is where I spent a big part of this afternoon. Uh, the feeds are brought to you by a partnership with explore.org. And you can also listen to a personal perspective from the founder of explore.org, Charles Annenberg, on why he chose to set up the Katmai Bear Live Cams. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly, but I really did spend a lot of time looking at this. Is that the, the camera that we're looking at today? Those are actual fish, not CG fish. <laughs> uh, do you like watching live wilderness cams, Jason? I, I don't, although this would be preferable to being in the direct vicinity of a bear. <laughs> uh, bears are fascinating, but I don't... Uh, I don't think, uh, yeah, I, I, I like, I used to like live webcams a lot. It's just that they're kind of distracting. It is yeah. amazing that we have, that we have webcams in all of these places. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, I'd rather, I think I'd rather watch like an edited video of the coolest parts of the webcam mm -hmm. rather than sit there and wait for the chicks to hatch or for the bear to catch that fish. But, uh, it's amazing that we can do this. I liked the live camera because it's like, you don't know what's going to happen. Like, you, you know, you, a tourist might walk up and get eaten by that bear. Like it's just, <laughs> or yeah. I mean, I actually am surprised. I see, I don't know how you could, I just want to sit here and watch this. Like those, that's are salmon, I guess, trying to, you know, get down river. It's Alaskan salmon. <laughs> yeah. And I, and, I can't look and away. It's, 
It's 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 dinner time. That make a great screensaver. <laughs> yeah. This is the point where you would find out, like, are people as interested in as I am in watching this to see whether this bear is going to catch those fish or did they just stop and uh, start listening to another podcast? We will know next year. <laughs> Jason, thank you so much for joining us and putting up with my Absolutely. crazy uh, third stump, thumb stories. And, um, uh, and <laughs> You know, it's July. Sometimes the news stories are the weird news stories this time of year. It just happens. Uh, yeah, I, I always, I actually go looking for some of the weird ones too. Um, you can only read about Moore's law for so long until you just, you know, need to see a live webcam of a bear. That's what I say. Yeah. I, th <laughs> I think that, that we, we ended in a very heartwarming place for everyone except for the fish. Yeah. We started with some bad news and we brought it, brought it good for, yeah. Well, some of those fish are going to get through. I think it looked like a lot of them were getting through. <laughs> sure, it's true. It's just every now and then somebody's gonna, you know, some uh, fish is not gonna make it. But you know, but yeah, you're right. Most of the fish will be happy, and the bear is happy, and we're happy. So it's a good story. Uh, Jason Snell is a writer at Six Colors and MacWorld, a podcaster at The Comparable and Relay FM, a frequent guest on so many Twitch shows. When we can pin him down, uh, thank you so much, Jason. For I'm happy us. to be here. Thank you for having me. It's always All fun. Right. Take care and continue your uh, 14 podcasts that you're doing in the span yes, of two days. <laughs> TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. That's 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv or you can leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. You can also hit us up on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. You can find all the ways to subscribe to our show at twit.tv. And if you want to tweet at me about which way downriver salmon, upriver or downriver salmon uh, spawn, please do. At Megan Maroney is where you'll find me. And thanks to our technical director and bear cam operator, Brian. Thank you to Patrick, who uh, is helping us out in the studio. There's the Patrick cam. Hi, Patrick. And thank you to Kevin for editing the show. And thank you to you especially for listening all the way till the very end. We will, see, I will not see you. Jason, I'm taking the day off. I'm going camping, find some bears. Uh, Jason Howell will be here with Ron Richards tomorrow and I will see you on Monday. Monday.